another property. If uh, your sequence is uniform integral, then uh, the supremum of rho n of fn is fine. which is almost the definition, but not quite. So how do we prove that? Well, we know that uh, the supremum over Ln of Fn bigger than M, Fn d mu, this thing converges to zero as M goes to infinity. Okay, that's the definition. So if that's true, it means that there exists an M large enough so that supremum over N of Fn bigger than M, let's call it M naught. This thing is less than one. Okay, you have a sequence that goes to zero. So it's less than everything you want, provided the thing is positive. Okay? Now you look at integral of Fn, and you split that into Fn larger than M0 and Fn smaller than M0, then okay, so we need, yeah, uh, yeah, we need to be on a space which is finite. All of this comes from probability theory, and there the space is one, the, the measure is one. Okay, so if we have that, then I can say that this is less than this guy, well, this guy is less than 1, plus uh, m naught mu of x. Okay, I know that the supremum is less than 1, so this, each one of them is less than 1, and this is less than m naught, and then I integrate 1, so I get mu of x. Okay, so that's this is a bound on any integral of fn. Therefore, the supremum over all n of these integrals is less than 1 plus m naught mu of x. I'm sorry? Oh no, you could take anything. I just picked one for co concreteness or, you know, yeah, you could have just use the bound actually. Uh, because you know that this bound here depends on m. You can call it c of m. And then you would have had a c of m here plus m mu of x, which is fine too. The important thing is get rid of the n. That's, that's what you want. OK, so this proves this uh, property. Now we're ready to finally state the theorem, which says the following. So we have a, a finite measure space. And we know that fn converges to f almost everywhere. 
actually you can do exactly what I'm going to do with Fn convergence to F in measure. But it gives more work and as we're going to see this is bad enough already. So we will stay with almost everywhere. So we have three equivalent uh, statements. Fn is uniformly integral. Fn converges to F in L1. And the integral of Fn converges to the integral of F. Okay, remember it, what it means that Fn converges to F in L1 is that Fn minus F converges to zero. So as promised, we have a necessary and sufficient condition in order to be able to pass to the limit inside the integral, okay, which is the main objective of uh, this topic. Okay, so what the theorem says is that i is equivalent to 2i, which is equivalent to 3i. And this turns out to be extremely useful in probability in particular. When you're looking at limits of random variables, uh, this comes up in particular when you're looking at so-called martingales, and uh, you, you can prove limit terms about martingales thanks to this. Okay, so let's uh, start this proof. First uh, step, we'd like to show that i implies two i's. So define the following function. which is m if x is larger than n, x if uh, x is between minus m and m, and minus m if x is less than minus m. So you just truncate uh, the higher and lower values of your function. What you have is Okay, that's what your function Tm is. Okay, a continuous function and uh, piecewise linear. And we're going to use Tm because uh, of a bounded convergence theorem. We want to have something bounded and in order to use the theorem. So, okay, so before I get into the proof, uh, just a, a lemma or it's, it's an easy. We have that the Tm x minus x is less than x. times indicator of x bigger than m. Or I should not write this like this. Okay. 
So uh, you have several possibilities. If absolute value of x is less than n, then Tm of x is actually x. Therefore, the left-hand side is 0. And you have 0 less than this guy, which is also 0. Uh, but it doesn't matter. It's a, it's, a true, it's a true statement in any case. Okay. Now, if x is less than minus m, then uh, Tm of x becomes minus m by definition. Therefore, we get absolute value of minus m minus x, which uh, turns out to be, so that's minus m minus x, that's m plus x, well, no, that's not what I want. Yeah, that's okay. That's that's a positive number. Minus m minus x. Okay, minus x is bigger than m, so minus x minus x is a positive number. And on the other side, we get absolute value of x Oh no, but that's uh, that's wrong. I want an absolute value here. So on this side, this is 1, and this is bigger than m. So I, I get uh, the inequality I want. So this looks messier than I. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, you see, if x is less than minus m, m plus x is negative. If m plus x is negative, it means that my absolute value here is minus m minus x, okay, the opposite. Okay, so this is correct. Now I go uh, to the other side. I look at absolute value of x, and absolute value of x is going to be bigger than m, and this is going to be 1. So on the right-hand side, I get m. On the left-hand side, I get minus m minus x. And we just need to check that. We just need to check that minus m minus x is indeed less than uh, less than m which uh, is so what do we have here x bigger than minus 2m or Yeah, maybe I should just, yeah, it's, um, uh, I shouldn't have written an inequality here. So here, this is my right-hand side. So my right-hand side, my absolute value of x is minus x, and this is 1. So what I get is exactly minus x. That's what I get on the right-hand side. And now the thing I need to check is that minus m minus x is actually less than minus x, which is true. Okay, you just compute both sides. Uh, there is, it's really just a question of checking this. Now, third case, when x is bigger than m, what happens? Well, Tm of x is m. And when you look at your absolute value on, on the left-hand side, you get m minus x. But because x is bigger than m, you get x minus m. And on the right-hand side, you get absolute value of x and positive infinity of absolute value of x. And that turns out to be absolute value of x, which is x. 
a gain inequality is true because x is bigger than x minus m. Okay? So you have that x minus m is less than x. This is also true. So the lemma holds. And that's going to be useful. So let's go back to our uh, theorem. What we are assuming, we are assuming that uh, uh, the Fn are uniformly integrable. Okay, I is that the Fn are uniformly integrable. And what we are trying to do here is prove that there is convergence in L1. So what we do is we look at this, right? We want to show that this thing goes to zero as n goes to infinity. That's the definition. So what we do for, in order to do that, we introduce the Tm. So we say this is Fn minus Tm of Fn plus Tm of Fn minus Tm of F uh, plus Tm of F minus F. Okay, I subtract the term, I add it, I subtract the term, I add it, and that's <laughs> what I get. It's only three terms, it's not so bad. So this is less than Fn minus Tm Fn plus Tm Fn minus Tm of F plus Tm of F minus F. Okay, just the triangle inequality. Now, there are two terms that look alike. It's the first and the third terms. They look alike. Okay, I'm going to use the same method to, to show that they go to zero. And what, are, what we're going to do is use the lemma precisely. So, By the lemma, we have uh, that so here. Yeah, let's go with this. that Fn minus Tm of Fn is less than, according to the lemma, it's Fn indicator of Fn of m positive infinity. So when we integrate this guy here, we get that this is less than Fn, Fn bigger than M. Okay, because you are integrating over where Fn is bigger than M. So that's exactly what this indicator is telling us. Uh, therefore, this is less than the supremum over all Ns 
of fn for fn bigger than m. And this goes to zero with m by definition of uniform integrability. Okay? So this goes to zero as m goes to infinity. So this takes care of my first term. Okay, maybe we should give them name. So this is term one, term two, and term three. For now let's deal with term three because it looks like term one. Term three, we use the lemma again and we say that Tm of f minus f is less than f bigger than m f. Same inequality as here. The only difference is that instead of having fn, we have f, but everything else is identical. Now, what am I going to use to show that this goes to zero when m goes to infinity? Why? Do you see one condition that would uh, uh, tell us that this thing goes to zero? That's again the problem three of the test. Okay, if your function is integrable, <coughs> this goes to zero. So the only thing we need to do is show that our function is integrable, which typically we do using FAT2. Okay, that's the other problem in the test. Okay, it's a very well thought of test. So have a look at it. So uh, what you do is you simply say this by Fatu, uh, let's put up some values, this is f because uh, remember our assumption is that uh, we have a uh, function which is converging almost everywhere, and then we take the absolute value, so this doesn't, it's a continuous function, therefore we, we get absolute value of f. And now, this is less than the supremum over all n of our integral. Okay, that's that's easy to see because when you do the limb inf, you, f you start by taking infimum, and that's certainly less than the supremum. And then you do, I mean, everything is bounded by this number. So, <coughs> and that, that was a property we saw. That's finite. By uh, uniform integrability, okay? We, we remarked that already, that the supremum of the integrals is going to be finite. Therefore, our function f is, is finite, is a, it has a finite integral, and this goes to zero by the problem three. So we took care of one and three. Now we need to take care of two. So for the second term, I claim that Tm of Fn converges to Tm of F almost everywhere. Why?
more. TM is continuous. TM is continuous. That's all. Fn converges to F almost everywhere. TM is continuous. Therefore, TM of Fn converges to TM of F almost everywhere. So, or, you know, I'm going to use, okay, another way to write it is just that this goes to zero. Now, I'd like to bound this by something. What do you suggest? plus m, right? Cannot go hi uh, higher than m, so this is less than uh, Tm of Fn plus Tm of F, and each of them is less than m, so this is less than 2m. Is 2m integrable? Why? Because we are in a finite space, yes finite measure space. So 2m is integrable. The dominated convergence theorem applies. And that's our third part. So this proves that if the sequence is uniform integrable, we have convergence in L1. Now, the following uh, implication is 2i implies 3i. And that's easy because L1 convergence is stronger than convergence of one integral to the other. And we did that already. So let's redo it. We're looking at. We want to show that this thing goes to zero. So that's by linearity. And then if I pull my absolute value inside, this is what I get. Now, as a consequence of the triangle inequality, we know that this is true. So this is less than this. But this goes to 0. So this thing is squeezed between 0 and something going to 0. It has to go to 0 as well. And we are done.
So now we want to show 3i implies i and we'll be done. Here is when things get really nasty. Okay, so first thing, tm is not quite good enough. We need another function to truncate. Okay, the idea uh, of many many of the probability limit terms is that you cut the pieces that are too large or too small, you prove your theorem on you know the middle section, and then you 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 argue that you know the the, the things you threw out are not that important. And that's that's always what we do. So that's that's what the idea is here too. Uh, okay, maybe a picture. We take SM to be the following. So define SM. to be uh, the function, what is it? It's x, okay, up to m minus 1. And then m is here, and you drop linearly here. And then it's a 0. Okay? Now, if we take a smaller m, we get something like this, and then it drops here, and then we have this. So we are going to have a monotone uh, sequence of functions. Okay, SM is going to be monotone. Yeah, the sequence SM is going to be monotone. Of course, the function is not monotone. Okay, so. So now we are assuming that the integrals converge, and we need to truncate stuff. So what are we going to do? Uh, we want to show uniform integrability, OK? So let's start by what we want here. OK. So. We start by writing that the integral of fn can be written into pieces, fn, fn less than m, plus fn bigger than m. Okay. Then uh, we get that. So what happens is that, you see, if I have a, if I have a positive x, I know that SM of x is always less than x. Okay, it's either equal to x, but then it drops. So for all positive x, SM of x is less than x. So what, that's what I'm going to use here. I'm going to say that this is less than, bigger than rather, OK? 
Okay, because I replaced uh, my Fn by Sm of Fn, therefore I get something smaller. And uh, what else? Then, uh, of course, I just so my Fn bigger than uh, m. Oh no, that's not the one I want. I want I want to replace it here. Sorry, Sm of Fn, and this one I leave it alone. Okay, so now uh, I just get that this is smaller than the integral over fn minus this integral sm of fn for fn less than n. But now uh, you see that if my if my x is bigger than m, uh, sm of x is zero. So really, this information here that fm is less than m is redundant, because in any case, if it's bigger, I get a zero for my function. So I can just erase this. It's equal to this. Okay. Yeah, now, so what we have at this point uh, we know that, so by, by the assumption 3i, the integral fn converges to f. So we can, we, we know that, so we know that there exists okay, so that's one thing we can use, and the other one Okay, I need to write, so this is a sign goes to infinity. Now the other thing I need to write is about SM of Fn. So what happens? Uh, what can I say about SM of Fn? It's going to converge to SM of F. Again, SM is a continuous function. And uh, Fn converges to F. So we have this by continuity of SM. So I know that too. Okay. So this is the the trouble with this proof is that you need to be careful uh, in taking your n and your m in the right order, and uh, it's not trivial. So yeah, that's okay. Now we have this. Okay, so I have these two convergence. I can therefore find n0 such that if n is larger than n0, we have that the integral, so I'm, I'm taking upper bounds, the integral of fn is less than the integral of f plus epsilon over 2. Okay, the difference is less than epsilon over 2 in absolute value, therefore I get this. And I get also that my, oh, okay. And now I can, I can again use the dominated convergence theorem because again I have a bound, which is m. Okay, that's the, the whole point here. Okay. So I'm also going to use the dominated convergence theorem to say, to say this. Maybe I shouldn't have picked S as a letter. 
So we get this less than integral of uh, Sm of f plus epsilon over 2. So we get these two inequalities that we can replace in here. Oh, maybe I, I need, for this one, maybe I need the, the other thing here. I'm going to use, because it's a minus on the other side, so let's take it bigger than minus epsilon over 2. So now when we look at our integral of fn bigger than m of fn, we get that this is less than this guy plus epsilon over 2 minus this guy plus epsilon over 2. So we end up with integral of f minus Sm of f plus epsilon. So the supremum over all n bigger than n naught, because all of this is true for n naught, of this guy here is less than the integral of f minus the integral of uh, Sm of f plus epsilon. Now if you let your m go to infinity, your Sm of f increases to, did I lost my absolute value? I need an absolute value here. Uh, Sm of f increases to f. Okay, remember what SM is? You truncate at M. So you get something bigger and bigger. If your F is infinity, you eventually get there because your M goes to infinity. If it's finite, you eventually get to your F. Okay, it's the same issue as in the test when you were, you were taking the minimum of F and N. That converges to F. So that's almost the same thing here. So you get this, and you can use the monotone convergence theorem to uh, tell you that the integral of Sm of f increases to the integral of f. So you see, you first take your supremum over n, and then you let your m go to infinity, and you end up with supremum of n bigger than n naught of my f. Uh, n bigger than m less than, so this became zero, so it's less than epsilon. Okay, well, that's actually, we already took the limit, so I should put here limit as m goes to infinity of this thing is less than epsilon. Therefore, the limit is zero. Okay. Now, uh, you need to be a little careful because we threw away the first and not of these guys. But that's again the same problem tree we talked about several times today, where every one of them is going to be as small as you want because they are integrable. So you can patch this with this to get that your sequence Fn is uniformly integrable. Okay, so Fn is uniformly integral. And so you get that your three uh, statements are equivalent. 
Now it's crucial in this that uh, we have a finite measure space. Even for it doesn't seem like you know we have used it that much, but several times we invoked the dominated convergence theorem, and our domination dominating function was a constant. That's only integrable if your space is finite, otherwise it's not. So it looks like Maybe we needed that because we're not that good, but no, that's not the reason. The reason is more deep than that, and it's, uh, it's, you really need that. Otherwise, the theorem is not true. Okay, so I'll ask you to fill up these uh, uh, evaluations, and if you could take them when you go to the office, that would be great. Thank you.